Hi, my name is Vic, and today we're going to learn how to use web scraping to download scores and stats from basketball games in the NBA. We'll start out by using Python and a package called Playwright to actually download the scores. Then we'll parse them using Beautiful Soup and Pandas. We'll read them into a nice data frame so we can do data analysis and machine learning. And in the next video, we'll actually use machine learning to predict who will win each game in the NBA. All right, let's get started. By the end today, we'll have a data frame that contains 17,000 different NBA games. And each row will show the results and stats from that game, who won and who lost, how many points each team scored, and some other advanced stats as well. And we'll be able to use this in the next video to actually predict who's going to win each game. All right, let's dive in and start web scraping. And in order to make our predictions, what we want is a box score from every game in a few seasons. And that's gonna give us enough training data for our machine learning algorithm. So this is a box score. It tells you which teams played, in this case, the Atlanta Hawks and the Charlotte Hornets. It tells you the score. It also gives you some basic and advanced stats about the game. So who played, how many points they scored, how much the team scored in total, as well as other stats like effective field goal percentage, true shooting percentage, etc. So by taking these stats from each team, we'll be able to use these to make predictions about who's going to win each game. All right. So our first step here is we want to be able to get box scores for every season. So we're on this site called Basketball Reference. We're going to start out on the seasons page. And we'll just click into a season, so the 2015 to 2016 season. And if we click on Schedule and Results, we'll see that we end up with a table that shows all of the games played in the NBA in October of 2015. So each of these has a link to the box score. So what we want to do is grab all of the individual links to the box scores. So you can see if you click box score, it gives you, it sends you to the actual box score. But in order to do that, we need to actually iterate through each month. So the October table only has the games for October. If we click on November, this gives us the games for November and so on. So our first step is to get this schedule and results page for each of the seasons that we want data for, and then to get go through each month and grab each of the links to box scores from that. So that's the first thing we'll actually do in our web scraping. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of the HTML because that's important as we scrape. So let me right click and hit inspect in Chrome, which pops up this inspector panel at the bottom, which shows us the actual HTML of the page. So if you're not super familiar with HTML, that's okay. I'll talk through what you need to know today, but HTML is created as a set of nested tags. So our outer tag here is the HTML tag that starts with HTML. And inside are two tags, the head tag and the body tag. So we won't worry about the head tag that usually contains CSS that styles the page and JavaScript. We can instead look at the body. This is where the main HTML of the page is. And inside the body, we see we have a bunch of different tags. So if we want just the, just this table, so we, we don't really care about the rest of the page. We just need these links for each month. And we just need this table that contains all the box scores. So if we inspect the HTML, we can figure out the actual pieces of the HTML that we need to select. So I'm going to right click on October and hit inspect. And what this shows us is the actual HTML for just this section. So we can see that there's a div tag with the class filter. So this is going to be important. We're going to remember this and we're going to use this to just select the elements, the links in, in this section here. And then when it comes to actually parsing the table, we can see that it's in this table. So it's a table tag in HTML and the ID is called schedule. 
So this will give us just what we need to scrape the table. All right, now that we understand what we're gonna scrape and how we're gonna do it, let's actually implement it. So I'll jump back to my notebook and we'll start coding. All right, I'm using Jupyter Lab. You can use Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook. You'll wanna do this on your own computer, not using Google Colab or something like that, because you'll need to install a few packages and you'll need to actually download some HTML. And that's gonna be easier running on your own computer. All right, so I already have a few files in this directory. Don't worry about those. Those are just some files that I made because I've already worked through this project. You're gonna start out by creating a new notebook. So I'm gonna click Python 3 here. And this notebook is going to be called Get Data. I'm gonna call it Get Data Live because I already have a notebook called Get Data. But you should probably just call yours Get Data. And this is the one that's going to download all of the HTML for us. And later we're gonna create a second notebook that'll parse the HTML and process it into a pandas data frame. So I'll go ahead and minimize this left panel here. There are a few things we'll need to install or configure before we get started. So we'll need to import the OS library, which actually comes with Python, so you don't need to install anything. We need to install a library called beautiful soup four and import it. So I'm gonna import it here and then I'll show you how to install it. So you can install it by typing pip install beautiful soup four. And this library is going to help us parse our HTML and extract the pieces we want from it. So that's beautiful soup four. The next thing we're going to import is Playwright. And from Playwright, we're gonna import what's called the async API. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We'll import async Playwright and we'll import a timeout error as playwright timeout. All right, so playwright is a Python library. It also exists in other languages that enables us to open up a web browser and grab the HTML from pages. So it'll open up a web browser session, navigate to a page for us and get the HTML in a certain part of the page. So Playwright is an alternative to Selenium. I personally like it more than Selenium. I think it's a little more beginner friendly. So that's why we're using Playwright. And to install Playwright, you can just type pip install Playwright. This little percent sign here runs something called a Jupyter magic. So you're able to actually run pip from inside Jupyter Notebook. And then once you've installed Playwright, you actually need to run one more command. And we're gonna use the exclamation mark here, which just runs a command on the command line. And we're gonna run playwright install. And this is going to configure all of the playwright web browsers. So it configures Chromium, which is the open source version of Chrome, Firefox, and I think WebKit as well, which is what Safari is based on. All right, so we're gonna run playwright install. We're gonna import the time library as well. This is built into Python, so don't worry too much about installing it. And now we can continue. Now we need to set up a few constants. So in Python, we use all caps for constants. I'm gonna create a constant called seasons. And this is going to create a list for us of years from 2016 through 2022. And these are the seasons that we wanna scrape data for. So this number is the ending year for each season that we want to scrape data for. So we're going to scrape data for the 2015 to 2016 season, 2016 to 2017, and so on. All right, now we'll just set up the directory where we're going to store our data. So I'm going to call it data2 because I already have a directory called data. You could probably call it data. It might be a little bit easier for you. We're also going to create a directory inside that directory to actually store our standings information. So this is the information that we scrape that lists all of the box scores out. Okay, and that's just gonna be a directory called standings inside that data deer. And then we're gonna create a directory to store all of our box scores. And that's going to be scores. All right, so this is just giving us pointers to the directories so we can reference them later, but we haven't created the directories yet. We can actually go ahead and create them in JupyterLab. So I'm gonna click on this folder icon at the top 
And then I'm going to create a directory called data2. I'm going to click into that directory. And inside, I'll create a folder called standings and another folder called scores. All right. And what's happening here is os.path.join is just combining this data2 with standings to give us the full path to these two folders, scores and standings. All right, so I'll go ahead and run that. I did not run my imports, so let me run those and then go ahead and run this. Now I'll minimize this left panel and let us continue. All right, so now we're gonna write a function that if we give it a URL and a selector, it can actually grab the HTML from a part of that page. All right. Now, a little complicating factor behind using Playwright in Jupyter Notebook. So Playwright operates asynchronously, which means that instead of a normal function, which works like this. So this function, do stuff, if you call it, will add together four and five, let's say, and immediately return. Whereas what an async function does is it runs asynchronously. So that means you can actually call, so let's, let's create an async function. You can actually call the function do stuff and it executes in another thread. So it doesn't execute in the main thread, which means you can do something like write do stuff and then write print one. And what happens is it'll actually start running do stuff then immediately after, even before do stuff is finished, it'll call print. So Playwright actually works asynchronously, which is a little bit different from how most Python code works. So we need to do a couple of special things to actually handle that. The reason Playwright works asynchronously is it's actually opening up a web browser, which can take a certain amount of time. It's communicating with that web browser and Sometimes you don't want that to happen in the main flow of your program. All right. So basically Jupyter Notebook, in order to use Playwright inside of it, you need to actually use Playwright asynchronously. And there's a couple of things we'll change as we write our functions to just account for that. All right. So the first function we're going to write will get HTML for us. So it, I'm going to call this async def get HTML. And again, the, the reason it's async is just to, to deal with Playwright. We're going to pass in a URL, a selector. We're going to specify a sleep interval, which I'll talk about more, and a number of retries, which I'll talk about later as well. All right. So we'll start out with our HTML variable equal to none. And then what we'll do is we'll say for i in range, one retries plus one. All right, so by default, our number of retries will be three, which means if the scraping fails, we'll retry it up to three times to see if it'll succeed. And this loop will just run our retries. Okay, and at the beginning of the loop, we're gonna say time.sleep, sleep, sleep times i. And what this is gonna do is we don't wanna scrape too fast. If we scrape certain websites too quickly, including basketball reference, we can actually get banned. So our, our scraping will stop working and we won't be able to access the site anymore. So we wanna be really careful. And what time.sleep does is it pauses our program for a certain number of seconds. And that's the sleep parameter here. So it'll pause for five seconds the first time it does, it, it tries to scrape data. The second time it tries to scrape data, it'll pause for 10 seconds. And the third time it'll pause for 15 seconds. The reason for this is if we're retrying, it means there was an error on the server. And sometimes that error can happen because the server has banned us. And if we wait for a little bit longer, sometimes the server will unban us. So for each retry, we, we actually sleep longer and longer to account for that. All right, now we're gonna wrap everything into a try accept block. So a try block will try to run some code. If there's an error, it'll, it'll handle it with some other code that you write. So inside this function, we're gonna say async with async playwright as p. So if you've opened a file before, this probably looks similar, right? With open file as f. This basically initializes our playwright instance for us. 
and it's async because we're working with the Playwright async API. Then we'll initialize our browser. We're going to say await p.chromium.launch, which is going to launch a Chromium-based browser for us. And Chromium is the open source version of Chrome. So this is going to launch a browser. What await does is it if if a function or a method is async, like get HTML is, right? We've written async def. It actually turns it into a synchronous method. It waits until that method is finished before continuing. So we're just going to say launch the browser, wait until it's done launching, and then continue running our code. Then we're going to say page equals await browser dot new page. So we're essentially creating a new tab in our browser. And then we're going to send our that tab to a certain URL. So the URL of the page we want to scrape. So we're saying await page.goto URL, which is going to send the browser in that tab to a given page, wait until it's finished. Okay. Then we're going to print out the page title, just so we know what our progress is in the scraping. And then we are going to grab the HTML. We don't want to grab all of the HTML for the page. So we're going to pass in a selector that will select only a certain piece of the HTML. And I'll, I'll show you in a little bit what pieces we are going to select when we actually call this function. All right. Now what we're going to say is accept playwright timeout. So. When there's an issue scraping the page or an error, Playwright will have Playwright timeout error, actually just a timeout error that it throws. We've renamed the timeout error to Playwright timeout because there's already a timeout error defined in Python, and we don't want to override that with this import. So we're going to just call it Playwright timeout instead. So when there's a Playwright timeout, we're going to print out that there was a timeout so we can actually see in our logs that there, that there was an issue here. We're going to say timeout on this URL, and then we're going to continue. And what continue does is it goes back to the top of the loop and tries again. So up to our number of retries, if the scraping fails, we will, we will just keep running this loop. Then we're going to add an else block. So the else block runs, if, if this whole code runs successfully, there's no error, then we jump to our else block, and here we're going to break. So if we had a successful scrape, we're just going to break this loop and not retry anymore. And then at the end, we're going to return our HTML. So if we fail, for, if three different retries fail, this will actually return none as our, as our return value. Otherwise, it will return the HTML of the page. And the reason why we're adding retries and, and all this other stuff is web scraping can be very unreliable. There can be a lot of random errors, some caused by the site banning you, some caused by your internet connection, whatever else. So you want to be really careful when you're scraping to make sure you add logic to, to retry and to just handle issues properly. All right. So that is our get HTML function. Once we have that function, we can actually start writing the code to scrape that single season page. Let me just jump back over and we will We'll look at that page one more time. So that's this page right here. And this page shows the 2015 to 2016 NBA schedule and results. And we can go month by month and see the box scores for all of the games in that month. So the first thing we want to do is get this list of months. I just opened the inspector so we can see the HTML here. We can see if we look at this div tag with the class filter. Inside this are all the links to our box scores for individual months. So we first need to grab these URLs for October, November, December. And then we can look through each of those URLs and get the links to the box scores. So the first thing I'm going to do is just grab all of these A tags. So an A tag is a link tag. So I'm going to grab all the link tags and then grab the href property, which is the actual link out of those tags. So let me jump back over to my notebook and let's start coding. So what we can say is let's start, let's just say our season is 2016. So for the 2016 season, we'll first have to create a URL that goes to that standings page that I showed you. 
So that's www.basketballreference.com slash leagues NBA underscore season underscore games dot HTML. So every season has the same general format for the URL, just the season number changes season to season. So we first create that URL and I'll show you what that looks like. So it just looks like this for 2016. And then we, we get our HTML. So I have to use the await keyword here because this is an async function and I want to get the results before continuing. So I'm going to call my get HTML function. I'm going to pass in my URL and then I'm going to pass in what's called a CSS selector. So to, to show you what this is doing, let me jump back over to the web page. Okay. So what this CSS selector is doing is it's first finding the element with the ID content and IDs are unique across the entire page. So there'll only be one element with this ID. So that's why I'm actually using the ID. So the hash says select an element by ID. Then I'm saying inside that element, there's an element with the class filter. Now classes are not unique. So you usually want to select based on an ID, and then you can use a class inside that ID if you want, but you usually want your outer selector to be something unique. And then I'm saying, find the class filter inside there. And the dot is basically saying match on a filter. So it's, it's basically going to return this HTML for each of these elements. Okay. So if I run that, once it finishes, we'll be able to actually see the HTML. All right. I have had some issues with getting the Chromium browser to work today, something with my computer at the moment. So when that happens, you end up with these just a moment messages and timeout errors and it never scrapes. What I'm going to do to fix this is just change this to Firefox. So it'll use the Firefox browser instead of Chromium. You probably won't need to do this, but I'm including this in the video just in case you also have the same issue. So I'm just going to rerun this function and then run the get HTML function again. All right. And when this is finished, we can actually take a look at our HTML and we can see that it contains, uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to see because it's messy, but you can see we have these a elements. So a is an anchor in HTML, which is a link. And you can see they have this href property. So we're actually going to grab all of the A elements and then grab the href properties from them. So to do that, we need to use a library called beautiful soup. So weird name, but very powerful library. And we're going to initialize it by calling the beautiful soup class. And we're going to pass in our HTML. Then what we can do is we can use the find all method, which will find all of a certain tag or element inside your HTML. So we're going to find all of the a tags, which are those anchor tags, which are the links. Then we can extract our hrefs from, from the a tags. So we'll say L href or L in links. All right, now let's see what happens. So we end up with our individual links to our standings pages. Now we need to turn these into full URLs. These are missing the beginning part of the URL. So what we'll say is standings pages equals F HTTPS basketball reference.com and then pass in our link for L in href. All right. So now we can take a look at standings pages and these are full links to our standings pages, which we can now scrape. All right. So let's stick all of this into a function. So it's getting a little bit messy. So this function is going to be called scrape season, and we're going to pass in a season. So a season number like 2016, 2017, and it's going to scrape all of the box scores 
for that season. And we're just going to copy and paste the code that we already wrote. We don't need to write more code in here. So we'll first create our URL. We'll grab the HTML. Then we'll create links to each of our individual standings pages. So our standings for October, November, December, etc. Then we'll loop through each of those standings pages. And we will we want to save them to disk. So I mentioned when you're web scraping, you don't want to try to process your data as you're scraping. You just want to save it and then process it later. So we're going to create a path to where we're going to save it. This is going to be in our standings directory. And our file name is just going to be the end part of our URL. So what this is going to do is it's going to split our URL based on the forward slash. So this is a URL. We're going to split it based on the forward slash, and we'll take the last part, which just gives us this, which is the file name that we're going to save this using. All right. And then we're going to write a little bit of code to say if os.path.exists, save path, continue. And that's basically saying if we already scraped it, don't scrape it again. Because sometimes scraping can fail in the middle, and you might want to rerun all of your scraping. And this way, if, if one of the pages already saved, you won't need to, to call the server again and go through the whole process again. It can take a while. All right. Now we want to get the table that, in, that has the box scores in it from our individual standings pages. All right. And that's this table here. So I'm going to right click and hit inspect again in Chrome. And we can take a look at this table. So a table in HTML is defined with a table tag. And this table is, is what we need because this has all the individual box scores inside of it. You can see that over here. All right, so we'll come back over here and we'll write the code to actually grab that table. All right, so we're gonna say HTML equals await, get HTML URL, and we're gonna use the ID all schedule, which is the div element that's just outside that table. That's the ID and it's gonna get us the full table. And then we're gonna save our HTML. I mentioned we wanna save this before we do any processing. We're going to open our file in write mode with W plus, and we're going to write our HTML to the file. All right. So that's our scrape season function. Let me go ahead and just clean this up. I'm going to delete these extra cells down here. And then we can write a, a loop that says for season in seasons, await scrape season, season. And what this is going to do is loop through each of our seasons. And for each season, it's going to scrape. And because this is an async function, we pass in the await keyword. So we make sure scraping one season finishes before we move on to the next season. All right. And we'll start to see this, is, this output is from our get HTML function, where we're printing out the page title. So we're starting to see the title of the pages that we're scraping. We'll see the same title several times in a row because we're scraping October, November, December, and they all have the same page title, the 2015 to 16 NBA schedule. So this may take a little while to run. Don't worry about it. But I'm going to move on to the next piece as this runs. All right. And when the scraping has finished, we can verify it has by taking a look at the files in our standings directory. And we can use the OS lister command to do that. That lists all of the files in a directory. All right. So let's take a look at standings files now. And we can see we have a bunch of files. Ignore this DS store. Mac just creates this file automatically for some reason. But you can see we have a bunch of individual tables that we can now process to get the box scores. All right. So let me just write a little bit of code here. So we're going to say standings file equals standings file zero. This is just so I can demo the code for you before we put it into a function. So we can open an individual standings file. 
So this is just the first file in the list. And we can say HTML equals F dot read. Now we can process this using beautiful soup. All right. And let me show you exactly what we want to pull out using beautiful soup. All right. So in this schedule table, there's links to all of the individual box scores. And if I right click on a box score, we can see that the box scores are also in a tags. So we get the link to the box score in this a tag. So what we're going to do is we're going to extract all the a tags from the table. And then we're going to look at the links that contain this string box scores, and we're going to pull them all out. And that's going to give us links to all of our individual box scores. So let's jump back and we'll, we'll code that up. All right. So we're going to get our links by saying links equals soup dot find all a same thing we did before. This is finding all of the links in our table. So, right. Okay. So I basically passed in just the name of the file, but I actually need the full path of the file. So I'm going to say os.path.join standings directory standings files. So that's going to give me the full path to the file. All right. So now let me check out links. And this is all the links in the table. So not all of these are actually box scores. Some of these are links to YouTube. Some of these are links to actual team pages. So I'm going to need to filter this to only grab the box score URLs. So these are the URLs that look like this, that end in .html and have the string box scores inside. All right. So the first part of this is just grabbing the href part of the anchor tag. So l.get href for l in links. So we can take a look to see what that did. So hrefs. So this just removed the, the HTML and just gave us the actual link. All right. Now we can filter this again using another list comprehension to actually just grab the, the ones that go to box scores. So we'll say L for L in hrefs, if box, if L, so if L, we'll basically make sure that L is not none. Some of these links, as you can see over here, some of the anchor tags have no href. So we want to just filter out the none values. We want to make sure box score is actually in the link, and we want to make sure .html is in the link as well. So that'll give us the box scores, just the links to the box scores. Then what we want to do is, like we did before, these are not a full path. They don't have the, the host name, so we just want to add that in. So we'll say box scores equals f https www.basketballreference.com and then add in the l for l in box scores all right so this gives us the full link to our box scores then all we need to do is loop through each of these box scores uh, and when we loop through them, we're actually going to download the full box score page. But we don't want the whole page. We want a selection of the page. So I've clicked into a box score here. This is the Atlanta Hawks playing the Charlotte Hornets. I can right click and hit inspect in Chrome. And what I want is I don't want all this top banner stuff. I don't need it. There's actually a div with the ID content. And this has the main content of the page. So the, the key stats, who won and lost, et cetera. So I only want to get this piece. So I, I will select just this piece when I, when I scrape each box score and save it. Okay. All right. So we need to define a save path. So this is where we're going to save our box score. This is going to be in the scores directory. And then again, we're going to get the file name that we want to save it as. And that's just going to be the last part of the URL. So we're splitting the URL on a forward slash and we're grabbing just this last part here. 
So we're creating a save path. We're going to say if os.path.exists, save path, just continue. This way we can keep running the loop to download all of the standings multiple times, and it'll ignore the files that it's already scraped, so we don't have to keep downloading them. Then we'll grab our HTML, and we're going to pass in the selector to select the tag with the ID content. So we're, we're going to only get that, that piece. We're going to say, if not HTML, continue. So if we've tried to download the HTML three times and it's failed all three times, we'll get none back. So if we got none back, we'll just continue the loop. And then we're going to say with open save path, W plus as F, F dot write HTML. All right. Now we can wrap this up into a function so it we can run it more easily. We're going to call this scrape game. And it's going to take in a single standings file. So we'll just delete this piece here where we're defining standings file. And then this function will scrape a single, sorry, it'll scrape a single standings file. So those are standings for a single month and a single season and save all of the box scores that are defined in that table. All right. Now we just need to create a loop to actually have this run. So we're going to say for season in seasons, files equals s for s in standings files if str season in s. So this is this is saying we're looping through each season. And let me actually take a look at standings files. This will grab only the standings files for a single season. So we're going one season at a time. All right, there's a couple of standings files where this will this will create some weird behavior, but we took care of this because we're not saving the HTML twice. We're only saving it once. So that will that'll fix that for us. And then we're going to say for f in files file path equals os.path.join. Standings dir f. And then we'll say await grape game file path. All right. So I just realized we don't need the outer part of this loop at all. You don't need to iterate by season. I don't know why I didn't realize when I wrote this, but you can just say for F in standings files. There's no reason to, to scrape season by season. Hey, sometimes you notice code you can optimize on the third look through it. All right, so we can run that and it's gonna loop through all of our standings files and scrape one by one. All right, so we'll, what we'll start to see here is we'll just start to see the titles of the pages that are being scraped, if we give it a second. So this is a page that's being scraped. This will take a while to run because of the sleep that's in here. So you can see sleep equals five. That sleep is gonna make it take a while to run. So don't worry if, it, if it, you have to leave it overnight to run or it takes a while. You can try reducing the sleep if you want, but be warned, you may get banned and you may not be able to scrape from the site anymore. So just be careful with adjusting that. I'll show you one other thing before we move on. You'll notice when I, when I ran my standings file, I'll just interrupt the kernel here. Clear the output. When I looked at standings files, you saw there was this DS store file. So one thing you probably wanna do before running this loop is you probably just want to say standings files equals s for s in standings files if dot html in s so that'll just quickly filter out any files that just run this separately that'll just quickly filter out any any weird files that just happen to be in that folder that are created by jupyter lab jupyter notebook or mac 
and it'll just give you the, the files that you want to scrape. All right, this may take a while to run. Don't worry if it does, but I'm going to move on to the next part, which is once you have your data, actually parsing the results into a pandas data frame. Okay. So we're back at our file browser here, and I'm going to go ahead and create a new Python three notebook, and I'm going to call this parse data live. You should probably just call yours parse data. I already created one called parse data. So that name is taken in this notebook. Our focus is going to be parsing our scores into a, a easy to use pandas data frame that we can pass into machine learning later. So I'm going to import OS again. I'm going to import pandas as PD. If you don't have pandas installed, you just want to run pip install pandas. If you're not familiar with pandas, it is an amazing data analysis library for Python. If you're doing anything data related, you need to be using pandas. We're also going to import beautiful soup because we need to parse our box scores with it. All right. So. Those are our imports. Then we're going to define our score directory. So this is just where our scores are stored. So we're just going to call it data slash scores. If you stored it in a different file, like data in a different folder, like data two, just change the folder to point to wherever your scores are. Then we're going to go ahead and read in all of our box scores. So we'll first list out all the files. So we'll take a look at box scores. So you can see this is a very long list of individual box scores. I scrape data for all of the seasons. So I have 8,888 different box scores. You may have more or less depending on how many seasons of data you scraped. All right, now we're gonna get our full path. So box scores right now just has the file name, but not the full path to the file. So we're going to join our score directory and our file name for F in box scores. And I'll add a little filter here just because, again, Mac and Jupyter Notebook can add some weird files to the directory. So we'll filter it to only files that end with HTML. All right. So that gives us our full file path to our to our box scores. All right. Now we're going to write a couple of functions. So our goal here is to pull out a single line of statistics from each box score, actually two lines, one for each team. So let me click in and I'll show you what a single box score looks like. This folder performs weirdly because it has so many files in it, but Jupyter lab hangs a little bit. So that was the stuttering you saw there. All right. So these scraped pages don't have the CSS styling that, that we had on basketball reference. So they look a little bit different. Don't worry about that. That's, that's just because we're missing the CSS. See, if you're not familiar with CSS, CSS styles HTML to make it look really nice when it's displayed to you in a browser without the CSS plain HTML can look weird. We want a couple of things from this page. So we want this line score table. So this indicates who won the game. The second team in this line score is always the home team. And the first team is the away team. So we want to indicate which team is home and away. And we want to pull this data out. We also want to pull out for each team, we want to pull out these basic box score stats. This is for the whole game. If you, we scroll down, this is quarter by quarter and half by half stats, but there's also advanced box score stats for each team as well. So we want one row for each team that contains the basic stats, the advanced stats, and the who won, so the line score. All right. So we will work on extracting that. Let me just right click and inspect and show you what the actual selectors look like. So if we look at this box score basic, the ID is just box, the team nickname, DET, Detroit, game basic. And advanced just replaces basic with advanced. So we need to use this ID to actually grab this table. 
There are a couple of things, cleanup pieces we're gonna do to this table just to make it nicer to actually parse using pandas. So this table has this thing called the overheader. So if we just parse this by default with pandas, it'll create a multi-level index, which is not what we want. We just want the column names. We don't want two layers where this is on top of this. So we're actually gonna use beautiful soup to remove this piece before we parse the HTML. And then we're gonna remove this line that says reserves and repeats the headers. This is useful when you're viewing the page, but when we're parsing the table, it's it's actually messes things up. So we're gonna do a little bit of cleanup before we parse the table. All right, let's write the code. All right, so the first thing we're gonna write is a parse HTML function. And we don't need to mess with async functions anymore because we've already used Playwright to download all our HTML. So we'll just be using regular functions from here on out. So this is gonna take in the path to a box score file. We're gonna open that box score file as F, and then we're gonna read it into our HTML variable. Then we're again gonna create a beautiful soup instance to parse it, similar to what we did in the last notebook. All right, then I told you we wanted to remove a few things in the HTML. We're gonna use the decompose method of beautiful soup to do that. So the first thing we want to do is use soup.select to actually select the pieces that we want to remove. So this is selecting a tr tag, which is a table row tag, with the class over header. So that was that weird thing that showed up above our above the actual column headers. So soup.select will select that. This actually returns a list of items, not a single item. So we're gonna write a list comprehension around this that calls s.decompose for s in. So this is gonna select all the tr tags with the overheader class. Then it's gonna call decompose on all of them, which actually removes them from the HTML. And then we're gonna do the exact same thing except we're gonna now do it for tr.thead, and that removes that weird reserves line that shows up in the middle of the table. And then we'll return soup. This runs in place, so we don't actually need to assign it back to anything. So what this does is it parses the HTML, cleans it up a little bit, and gets it ready for further processing. All right. So now what we can do is we can say soup equals parse HTML box score. And we can just say box score equals box scores zero. I'm eventually gonna write a loop to process all of the box scores, but I wanna show you how it looks processing a single box score before we do that. All right, so now soup is just gonna be a beautiful soup instance but with the HTML modified and those extra lines removed. Now we need to write a function called read line score. That's gonna read that line score that indicates how many points each team scored and who won. So here's a function called read line score. And this is gonna take that beautiful soup instance and we're gonna actually use pandas to read in our line score table. So let me click back over here. This is our line score table here. And if I right click on it and hit inspect, we can see that it has this, this ID, the ID line score. And pandas can actually process HTML table elements and turn them into data frames, which is awesome. So we're gonna tell pandas to grab this table with the ID line score and process it for us. All right, so let's jump back over here. So we're gonna use the pandas read HTML function to do that. We're gonna call str, which actually gets the HTML out of our beautiful soup class. So we're gonna call str on that to just turn it into a string. And then we're gonna tell pandas, we want it to process the table that has the ID line score. 
the way we specify selectors and pandas and in beautiful soup is a little bit different. So we're passing in this atters keyword for attributes. And we're saying the attribute we want you to look at is the HTML attribute ID, and we want it to be equal to line score, which selects the line score table. And by default, read HTML returns a list of data frames. So we just want to grab the first data frame out of that. All right. Let me actually show you what this looks like down here. So this will return the line score table as a data frame. The column names are a little bit weird though. So we're just gonna do a little bit of fixing to fix up the column names. Okay, so first we're gonna convert the column names to a list from a index. Then we're gonna say that the first column name will be team. And then we're gonna say that the last column name is gonna be total. And then we're going to assign that to back to the columns. All right. Let me just show you what that does over here. So now we can take a look at line score and we can see that we now have the team and total columns. So I'm actually gonna remove these quarterly scores. And the reason I am is some games go into overtime, some go into double overtime, some go into multiple overtimes beyond that. I think the NBA record is six overtimes, which is crazy. I don't know how you play basketball for that long. But basically what that does is it creates issues when we try to put all of the scores from different games into a single data frame. So we're gonna get rid of this middle part just to prevent that issue. So we're gonna say line score equals line score team total, All right? And then we'll return line score. All right, so that is our read line score function. And what we're gonna write here is instead of all that stuff, we're just gonna say line score equals read line score suit. All right, now we can grab the team codes out of our line score. Those team codes are, actually I'll just show you instead of telling, that can sometimes be nice. So it'll just grab our team codes, which in this case are Atlanta, ATL, and D Dallas, D-A-L, Dallas Mavericks. Now what we wanna do is parse the, the two tables I showed you, the basic stats and the advanced stats for each team. And we're gonna process each team separately because each team has different stats, right? Their players scored a different number of points, had different number of field goals attempted, et cetera. So we're gonna loop through each team. We're gonna say for team in teams. Now we need to create another function that can actually read our stats tables. And this is just gonna be called read stats. We got the def, def read stats. It's gonna take in soup, team, and the stat that we wanna read. All right, so jumping back over here, we wanna grab two tables for each team. So this is the basic box score. So it shows you just some basic stats about the team. And if you remember, the ID here is box, then the team code, then game, then basic. And then if we scroll down, we can also see the advanced stats. So that's in this advanced box score stats. And the ID here is almost the same, except it ends in advanced instead of basic. So we're just gonna grab those two tables for each team. All right, so we'll write our read stats function here. All right, okay, read stats. First, we're gonna read in our, similar to what we did when we parsed the table before, we're just gonna parse our, our table for this, the specific table for the stat that we want. And we're again gonna say attributes ID. This time our ID is gonna be a little bit more complex. So we're gonna say box team, so the team code game stat. So if you'll remember, it looked like box DET Detroit game basic. 
this will create a string that looks like that. All right, and then we're gonna say index call equals zero. The first, the first column of our data should actually be the index. That's the player name. And then again, we're just gonna index it with zero because this returns a list by default. All right, now we're gonna run another method. And this is just gonna convert our columns to numeric columns. Okay, so what this is gonna do, let me just show you what this does. Okay. All right, let me show you what this does. All right, so by default, you see that this read in but some of these columns have strings in them, like did not play, which means that the column can't be converted to numbers, but we actually need it to be a numeric column if we wanna use it for machine learning. So we're actually gonna convert each of these columns to numeric, and we're gonna say if there's a string here, like did not play, just add in an NAN value, which makes sense, right? Their stats are missing because they had no stats because they didn't play. So we're just gonna remove those strings. That's what this PD to numeric piece does. And then we're just gonna return our data frame. All right, so for team and teams, we're first gonna read in our basic stats. We're gonna say basic equals read stats, soup team basic. Then we're gonna read in our advanced stats. So very similar, except we're gonna pass in advanced. All right, now let me go ahead and run that. I have to define my read stats function, then I can run that. And then I can take a look at advanced. And we can see that we have stats for a lot of different players, but I need one row per game if I wanna actually use this to make predictions with machine learning, right? Machine learning needs all the values for a single record to be in one row. So I need to actually compress this data somehow. So the first way I'm gonna compress it is only pull out these totals. So I'm gonna ignore all, all of these other rows just for now, I'll come back to them in a bit, and just pull out the totals. And that's just the last row in each, in each data frame. So I'm gonna say I want to concatenate the last row of the basic data frame and the last row of the advanced data frame. And I wanna smush them into a single Panda series. All right, so what ILOC does is it indexes a data frame by position. And the position I'm passing is negative one, which means select the last row and all of the columns. And then I'm concatenating it. And I'll show you what that concatenation does. So, so let's take a look at total. So it basically puts all of the values into a single column, a single pandas series, which is great, the advanced and the basic stats. All right, now we're gonna create maxes, and this is going to be the maximum value for each player. So when we looked at our stats before, we had a bunch of different rows. To compress this down to a single row, we're basically going to look at all of our players and just take the player who had the highest points or the highest field goals attempted or whatever else. So here that would be 20, Dirk Nowitzki or Deron Williams. All right, so we're again gonna use pandas.concat, but this time we're gonna say basic.iloc up to negative one, which means take all of the rows except the last one, and then we're gonna call max. We'll also, this is this is optional, saying that you want to select all the columns, but I'll do it just so it's explicit. And then we'll do the same thing with advanced. Actually, I can just copy and paste this and just change basic to advanced. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at our maxes now. So this gives us the highest number that an individual player had in the game. So this is the most three-pointers that a player made in the game. 
for, for a certain team and so on. All right, so we generate our maxes. We have to change the index for maxes though, because currently these columns are named the same as the columns in totals. And we, we want them to be different so that pandas actually treats them as separate columns. So we're gonna go ahead and lowercase, and then we're gonna add underscore max. And we'll do the same with totals too. Actually, I'll call this totals instead of total. Index.str.lower. All right, so what this does is it takes all the column names and just turns them into lowercase. So that's, that's what the lower method is doing. The str is just the string accessor in pandas that lets you access a lot of different string manipulation functions. All right, so now we can take a look at totals. I messed up there. I should say totals.index equals that. So we can take a look at totals. We can see all our index names are lowercase. We can take a look at maxes. We can see all of these are lowercase and they have max added to them. So we can distinguish them from totals. And then we're just gonna put them together. We're gonna say pandas.concat totals maxes. And that's our summary. We can take a look at our summary. And this has 72 different values and each value is a statistic for that team. All right, now kind of a kind of a strange thing we need to do. Different box scores I found have slightly, slightly different stats that they indicate. So we wanna actually standardize those. Make sure that we get the same stats for every game because otherwise it's, it's gonna be hard to actually feed our values into machine learning. If some games we have 200 stats, other games we have 100 stats, we actually need to have a consistent set across our games. So at the beginning, and I'll actually just stick the loop in here so it's more obvious. We're not gonna use this loop yet, but we will eventually. So inside this loop, the first time we go through the loop, we are going to look for a variable called base columns. So I'll say base calls equals none outside of here. And then we're gonna say if base calls is none, base calls equals list summary dot index dot drop duplicates keep equals first. All right, so what's this gonna do? So the first time through the loop, we're gonna find all of the values in our box score. And we're gonna say, okay, these are gonna be the values that we use and look for in all of our other box scores. And we're gonna also remove any duplicates that we have. So you may have noticed that the MP value, minutes played is actually duplicated because that value is in the basic and advanced stats tables. We don't need that value twice. So we're also just gonna remove duplicates while we're at it. And then we're gonna remove a specific stat called BPM. And the reason for that is BPM exists in some box scores and not others, and it causes some issues. So we're just gonna remove it. All right. Now we can say summary equals summary base calls. So only selecting the columns that we had in our first summary. All right, then we're going to create, so this is creating the summary for a single team. We're gonna append that to our summaries list, which has, which contains, which will contain the summary for both teams that played a game. All right, now we jump out of this inner loop here and then we'll concatenate our summaries into a single summary. And let me just run this so you can see what it looks like at this point. All right, so at this point, zero is the away team, one is the home team, and we have all of these statistics. Now we want the stats to actually be the columns. So I'm gonna call dot T on this to actually turn our data frame. And you'll see it's turned it, so the rows became the columns. 
which is uh, is just a more logical way to look at it. All right. Now we're going to combine our summary and our line score together. So we're going to concatenate using the pandas concat method. And we're going to say axis equals one, which means combine them, assume that you're going to add in new columns to summary. So we're going to add all the line score values as columns. So let's take a look at game. So we have a few extra columns at the end to indicate the team and the total points that team scored. All right, so that's game. Then we're going to we're going to assign a column to indicate who was at home. So that's going to be 0 if the team was away, 1 if the team was at home, and the first team is always away based on just how the table looks in our data. So you remember the first team is the away team. So we're going to go ahead and assign that. Then we'll take a look at game and we'll see we have the home and away assigned. All right. And to train our machine learning model, it's useful to have both stats from the team. So whatever team is playing. So in this case, in this first row, Atlanta, it's also useful to have stats about your opponents. So we're actually going to concatenate opponent stats together with the stats for the team that played. So we're going to create a data frame called game op, so opponent, which is just going to be game.iloc. So this is reversing the data frame so that the first row is now the second row and vice versa. So let's actually take a look at this. All right. So this is putting Dallas first, Atlanta second. But if we just look at our regular game data frame, Atlanta was first and Dallas was second. So this is our opponent data frame. We're going to reset the index. This just helps when we concatenate our data frames together. And then what we're going to do is we're going to rename our columns. All right. So we once we run this, we can take a look at game op. I'll add an underscore there. All right, so we can see that we have all of the values, but this is for the opponent. And we're gonna concatenate it with our regular game data frame. So these give you the opponent stats, who you played, how many points they scored, what their stats were, along with the stats for the actual team that played. So we're gonna create a new data frame called full game. We're again gonna concatenate. We've used concatenate a lot. And we're going to pass in axis equals one, which means treat the, all of these as columns and add the columns together. Let's take a look at full game now. All right. So our first row is for Atlanta. The opponent is Dallas. And we have a bunch of stats for the opponent. We also have stats for Atlanta together. And same for the second. The second row is for Dallas when they played the game but it also gives us our opponent stats and our opponent was Atlanta. All right, so we've put that together. The next thing we wanna do is just add in some information about the game itself. So which season was this game in? This is gonna help us when we train our machine learning model. So we're gonna to have to write a quick function called read season info that will just figure out which season this game happened in. So we'll take in our beautiful soup instance. And the best place to actually read the season is all the way down here at the bottom. Let me find it for you. All right, so there's this thing called bottom nav. And if we look inside this bottom nav container, we can see that there is a date here when the game was played. So we're going to pull the season out of this, and that'll tell us which season this game was played in. All right, so read season info. We're going to take in a beautiful soup instance, and then we're going to process it to just get the season number. All right, so first thing to do is to write 
nav equals soup soup i can type here soup dot select hashtag which means select a specific id bottom nav container and we're just going to again select the first element so select by default will return a list we just want the first thing it selects which is this bottom nav container and then we're going to find all of the links in the bottom nav container This is all stuff we've talked through before. So we're gonna find all of the anchor tags in the bottom nav container and then pull out the link. And then our season is going to be os.path.base name, which is just the last part of, of a link. It's gonna pull out that first link and it's gonna split it on the underscore. And we're gonna take the first element. So let me show you exactly what it is pulling out there. So we look at all these links down here. So if you look at this bottom nav container, there's a link here. There's another link down here. So we're going to, we're going to actually grab this link. Sorry. I said we were going to parse this before, but it's actually easier just to parse this link. So we're going to grab this link and just pull out the piece that says 2016. So we're going to first grab the last part of this link. We're going to split it on the underscore, and then we're just going to take the beginning part, which is 2016. All right. And then we'll return the season number. So that's read season info. Okay. So we go back down here, full game season equals read season info. parentheses, not brackets here. And I do not need quotes around soup. All right. So that'll read the season info in. Let's look at full game again. We can see 2016 is now our season. So this game was played in the 26, 2015 to 2016 season, which is right. Then we want to just add in the date that the game was played. And this we can actually get from the file name. So os.path.base name will return just the last part of the file name, which if we just look at box score here, is this. So base name will just return this part. And then we're just gonna grab the first eight characters of that, and that gives us the date. It gives us the year, the month, and the day, 09. So let's see, box score, and then up to eight characters. And then we're just gonna say full game date equals pandas.toDateTime. So by default, this will be treated as a string, but we're just gonna convert it to a date time. And we're, we're gonna tell pandas what format our date is in. So it's in the format here. So you can look up date formatting if you want, but the percent %y is year, percent %m is month, percent %d is day. And you can see that that's the format this is in. All right. We can take a look at full game now. And we can see we now have a date column at the very end that gives us the date the game was played. Now, most importantly, we need to specify who won the game. And this equals full game total is greater than full game op total. So if your number of points is greater than, actually it's total op because I put op on the end. If your number of points is greater than your opponent's number of points, then you won the game. If not, you did not win the game. So we now have a little one column that indicates who won the game. So these are all the op columns. You can see that Atlanta actually won this game. And this first row is Atlanta, indicating they won. The second row is Dallas, indicating Dallas lost. All right. And then at the very beginning of this loop, we're going to create a list called games. And then to the games list, we're going to append full game. All right. Let's actually get this loop going. So I'll, I'll just 
highlight all this and indent it into the loop so that this is in a loop. And the last thing we'll do is this loop is gonna take a little while to run. So I just wanna print out some progress messages. So every hundred games it processes, it's just gonna print out the total number of games it's processed divided by, it, it's not gonna divide, but it's gonna show the forward slash division symbol. And it's gonna show the total number that exist. So this will just print out some status for us. So I can go ahead and click run now, and this should actually run through. This will take a while, as I mentioned, but you should start seeing some progress as it starts processing box scores. All right, I ended my run a little bit early because I wanted to show you all the rest of the code here. So I have, I have fewer games processed than you probably will, but once it finishes running, what we wanna do is concatenate all of our games together. So we're gonna use pd.concat, and this will combine all of our games, and it'll treat each game as rows. So before we were using axis equals one, but by default, this does axis equals zero, which basically stacks all of the data frames on top of each other. So we can take a look at our games data frame, and we can see that we have each row is a team in one game that they played, and we know whether they won or lost, I only have 524 rows, but if you processed all of them, when I processed all of them, I ended up with 17,772. This is just a partial process. And you should have 150 columns for this as well. You may get an error when you run pandas.concat that there's an index issue. And what this means is that one of your data frames or more have different columns from the others. So the way to check that is what you can do is you can do g.shape for g in games. And shape will show you how many rows and columns the data frame has. So you can look at the most common number of columns, which is 150. We'll just actually get the g.shape1, which just gives us the number of columns. If g does not equal 150. In my case, they all do equal 150. Sorry, if g.shape1 does not equal 150. In my case, they're all, they're all 150, so this list doesn't have anything in it. For you, if you get an error, you may have a couple that show more than 150. And what you'd wanna do then is basically look at the ones that have a different number from 150, and you can actually remove them. So you can do a list comprehension to, to only keep the data frames that have 150 columns, or you can try to investigate them more. But that's how to fix that error. All right, now the last thing you wanna do is you don't want all of this hard work to go to waste. So you wanna write this to a CSV file, which I'm gonna call nbagames.csv, and you can store that and in the next webinar that I talk through, you will learn how to actually predict who's gonna win each NBA game using these stats. So using the stats from one game, can we predict how a team will do in the next game? So stay tuned for that, and I hope you enjoyed this webinar. If you did enjoy this webinar and you wanna learn more about data science, you can actually learn a lot on DataQuest, which is the website that I started. There's tons of interactive lessons and projects that teach you all of the data science concepts ranging from Python to pandas to machine learning. I hope you'll check it out. All right, thanks a lot.